Hi, and welcome to the Planting Community Church. My name is Anna Johnson, and I'm your host for this morning's announcement. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us online today. There's a lot happening at PCC, and we want you, yes, you, to participate and connect with us as much as you can. Here's what's happening at PCC over the next month. August is the final month for a summer midday Bible study group. On Fridays, set time aside to join us for engaging discussions and a chance to learn together from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. If you would like to join, please email info at theplanting.cc for more information. Are you interested in volunteering at PCC but aren't sure where to start? Visit our website, theplanting.cc, click on serve and sign up today to indicate your intent. There are several ministries that currently need volunteers, so we invite you to connect with us and bring your talents. Every Sunday at 11 a.m., join us on YouTube or Facebook to view our worship service with a message from our pastor, Marcel James. You can also visit our website, theplanting.cc, to ensure that you stay connected with us. At PCC, we have programming for children too. PCC Kids is a space where children and their parents meet to learn about Jesus in a fun and engaging environment. Each week, our children's ministry team hosts PCC Kids meetings online from 1 to 2 p.m. Meeting information will be sent to parents each week. Our Wednesday night prior meeting and Bible reflection sessions are a great way to learn with others. Challenge yourself to set aside an evening each week to grow deeper in the Word and connect to pray, especially with the needs around us. Meet us online each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. via Google Meet. If you have a prayer request, please leave a message at 416-653-2528 or email us at info at theplanting.cc. We encourage you to continue giving your tithes and offerings as the work of the Lord depends on your giving. Online giving can be done securely using Tithely or using e-transfer using the email info at theplanting.cc. If you would prefer to write a check instead, please mail it to our address at 236 Marin Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, M6E 4H4. Thanks again for choosing to worship with us online today. Consider following us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel by hitting the subscribe button below so that you continue to stay connected with us. Visit theplanting.cc for more information. May the peace of God rest with you this week and always stay safe. Sometimes in life, we go through ups and downs, but no matter what, Jesus is worthy to be praised. Yes, he is our rock, he is our strength. Yes. When we are weak, he is strong. He will take everything to him. And he will protect us. He will guide us. Yes. He will walk us through. Yes. Because he is our light. He is our guide. Yes. And he is our only strength that we can hold on to. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God. Hallelujah. You are worthy. Yes. You are worthy, Hallelujah. worthy, worthy to be praised. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord.
Good morning, PCC family and friends. I want to greet you today in the precious name of Jesus. I pray that you would experience his love, joy, and peace today. As you stop by to worship with us today, I just want to pray for you that God will minister to you today, that the Holy Spirit will fill your space with his presence, with his glory, and with his power. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for all those who are watching this program. Program. Father, I pray that your presence will show up in their space, in their room, on their tablet, on their iPhone, on whatever they're listening to today. I pray that your Holy Spirit will empower, will continue to lift up your people, to see your face, to see your strong arms around them today, God, whatever your people are going through. I pray, Father, today that they would know that God God is good, that you are real in the midst of life's struggles. You are an ever-present help in time of need. So God, I pray that as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us today. And God, that we would hear from you. We will see your face. We would understand the goodness of God, even in the land of the living. We pray today for every soul that you would just pour out your spirit upon our lives today in the precious name of Jesus. That's all we ask for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. Amen. Today, we're going to look into the word of God and we just want to continue our theme from a couple of weeks ago, following Jesus. And today I want to speak to the theme of following Jesus steadfast in faith, steadfast in faith or with steadfast faith. Amen. You know, we need faith. We need strong and steadfast faith because we have a lot of enemies and, and sometimes our enemies is not physical. They're not flesh and blood, but enemies of our faith, things like inertia, complacency, apathy, and self-preservation. Fear, this, this unmitigated evil that comes into our life and robs us of our health and our wellness. You know, I, I've been looking at a lot of things about retirement and about longevity, tips to stay strong and well. And I came across an article written by um, Tom Popo Manor Manoris. He's a contributor to a... A, a paper um, from which I took this article. And he writes about a Japanese doctor who's a longevity expert. His name is uh, Dr. Shigaki Hinohara. I hope I'm saying that right because it's Japanese. He's a Japanese physician who became an expert on longevity until the age of 105. When he died in 2017, Hinohara was chairman emeritus of St. Luke's International University and honorary president of St. Luke's International Hospital, both in Tokyo. Perhaps best known for his book, Living Long, Living Good. Hinohara offered advice that helped make Japan the world leader in longevity. Some were fairly intuitive points, while others were less obvious. And I'm going to read those points to you, one to five. Number one, he rewrites, don't retire, but if you must, do it, do it a lot later than age 65. The average retirement age, at least in the U.S., has always hovered around age 65. And in recent years, many have embraced the FIRE movement, which is the acronym for Financial Independence Retire Early. But Hinohara, he viewed things differently. He says, there is no need to retire, but if one must, it should be a lot later than 65. He said in 2009 interview with the Japan Times, the current retirement age was set at 65 a half a century ago, when the average life expectancy in Japan 
was 68 years and only 125 Japanese were over 100 years old. Today, he explained, people are living a lot longer. The life expectancy for, you, for the U.S. in 2020, for example, is 78.93 years, a 0.08% increase from 2019, therefore we should be retiring much later in life too. Hinohara certainly practiced what he preached. Until a few months before his death, he continued to treat patients, kept an appointment book with space for five more years and worked up to 18 hours a day. Secondly, he says, take the stairs and keep your weight in check. Hinohara emphasized the importance of regular exercise. He says, I take two steers at a time to get my muscles moving, he said. Additionally, Hinohara carried his own packages and luggage and gave 150 lectures a year, usually speaking 60 to 90 minutes, all standing, he said, to stay strong. He also pointed out that people who live an extremely long life, what they have in commonality is they aren't overweight. Indeed, obesity is widely considered one of the most significant risk factors for increased morbidity and mortality. Hinohara's diet was Spartan. For breakfast, I drink coffee, a glass of milk, some orange juice with a tablespoon of olive oil in it. Studies have found that olive oil offers numerous health benefits, such as keeping your arteries clean and lowering your heart risk. He says for lunch, it's milk, a few cookies, or nothing when I'm too busy to eat, he continued. I never get hungry because I focus on my work. Dinner is veggies, a bit of fish and rice, and twice a week I have 100 grams of lean meat. And then thirdly, he says, Find a purpose that keeps you busy. Find a purpose that keeps you busy. According to Hinohara, not having a full schedule is a surefire way to age faster and die sooner. However, it's important, it is important to stay busy, not just for the sake of staying busy, but to be active in activities that help serve a purpose. The logic is, that one can be busy, yet feel empty and idle on the inside. Hinohara found his purpose early on, after his mother's life was saved by the family's doctor. Janet Kakawaguchi, a journalist who considered Hinohara a mentor said, he believed that life is all about contribution. So he had this incredible drive to help people, to wake up early in the morning and do something wonderful for other people. This is what was driving him and what kept him living. It is wonderful to live long, Hinohara said in an interview, until one is 60 years old. It is easy to work for one's family and to achieve one's goals. But in our later years, we should strive to contribute to society. Since the age of 65, I have worked as a volunteer. I still put in 18 hours, seven days a week and love every minute of it. Fourthly, he says, rules are stressful. Try to relax them. While he clearly promoted exercise and nutrition as pathways to a longer and healthier life, Hinohara simultaneously maintained that we need not be obsessed with restricting our behaviors. We all remember how as children, when we were having fun, we would forget to eat or sleep. He often said, I believe we can keep that attitude as adults. It is best not to tire the body with too many rules. Richard Overton, one of America's oldest surviving World War veterans would have most likely agreed right until his death at the age of 112. 
This super centurion smoked cigars, drank whiskey, and ate food that was fried and ice cream on a daily basis. Hinohara might not have approved of Overton's diet, but to be fair, Overton did credit his longevity to maintaining a stress-free life and keeping busy. Lastly, Hinohara says, remember that doctors can't cure everything. Oh, don't we know that? Hinohara cautioned against always taking the doctor's advice. When a test or surgery is recommended, he advised, ask whether the doctor would suggest that his or her spouse or children go through that same procedure. Hinohara insisted that science alone can't help people. It lumps us all together, but illness is individual. Each person is unique and diseases are not connected to their hearts, he said. To know the illness and help people, we need liberal arts, visual arts, not just medical ones. In fact, Hinohara made sure that St. Luke's catered to the basic need of patients to have fun. The hospital provided music, animal therapy, and art classes. Pain is mysterious. And having fun is the best way to forget it. He said, if a child has a toothache and you start playing games together, he or she immediately forgets the pain. Six, find inspiration, joy, and peace in art. Have fun. According to the New York Times, toward the end of his life, Hinohara was unable to eat, but he refused the feeding tube. He was discharged and died months later at home. Instead of trying to fight death, Hinohara found peace where he thought where he was through art. In fact, he credited his contentment and outlook toward life to a poem by Robert Browning called Up Volga. Volga. Especially these lines, there shall never be one lost good. What was shall live as before. The evil is not, is not, is silence implying sound. What is good shall be good with for evil, so much good more. On earth, the broken arcs. In heaven, a perfect round. My father used to read it to me. Hinohara recalled, it encourages us to make big art, not small scribbles. It says to try draw a circle so huge that there is no way we can finish it while we are alive. All we see is an arc. The rest is beyond our vision, but it is there in the distance. Oh, the wonders of Google. I got I, I got this um this hit on longevity because you know somewhere in in my searching I was looking up longevity you know I was interning at a long term care facility a couple of years ago I was working on a paper for a course on reconciliation and my chaplain supervisor in the home was gracious to allow me to use his setting for my research. One of the things I learned about this age demographic, the, the centurions and those in their 90s, is that most of them were um, in the long-term care setting, but they weren't happy being there. Most of them felt that people assumed that they were at the end of their life. Many expressed the thinking that they were just placed there to wait for death. In their thinking, they felt that we had diminished their value and purpose and presumed that once a person turned a certain age, they no longer matter or have desires or dreams. So we placed them in the age old box like a piece of antique art. The conflict that folks in their 10th decade of life and those over 90 faces, the centurions, is what uh, Eric Erickson, the psychologist, calls 
um, the conflict of desire versus struggle. You know, we will forever have desires until the day we take our last breath. The problem is that in those struggles to get our desires met, they're often framed by others' opinions of what we should be going through and where we should be at. You know, Jesus in, 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 in his uh, ministry came across many people who had opinions of what they think he was about and what mattered. We're going to look at a text in Mark, Mark chapter 8 to draw um, a narrative out and see how opinions can lead to misinformation. I'm going to read from Mark 8, verse 31, and to the end of this chapter. Jesus um, began to teach them, his disciples and his followers, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and that he would be rejected by the Jewish elders, the leading priests and the teachers of the law. He told them that the Son of Man must be killed and then rise from the dead after three days. Jesus told them plainly what would happen. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to tell him not to talk like that. But Jesus turned, looked at his followers. Then he told Peter not to talk like that. In fact, he said, go away from me, Satan. You don't care about the things of God but only about things people think are important. You don't care about the things of God, but only about what people think are important. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his followers and he said, if people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want they must be willing to even give up their lives to follow me. Those who want to save their lives will give up true life. But those who give up their lives for me and for the good news will have the true life. He said, it is worthless to have the whole world if you lose your very soul. They could never pay enough to buy back their souls. The people who live now are living in a sinful and evil time. If people are ashamed of me and my teaching, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes with his father's glory and with the holy angels. Chapter 8 of the book of Mark highlights an interaction between Jesus, the Jewish leaders, and his own disciples. It seems that as people are following Jesus, they have some real life struggles. They're concerned about what people are saying around them on the internet, through the grapevine, they want to follow and believe in Jesus, but they also desire more tangible or, or, or continuous evidence that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Some, the very religious, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, follow because they want to see him fail. They want to trip him up so that people will lose faith in him because they were simply jealous of him. And the scripture repeats that. Herod, on the other hand, wished for Jesus to do miracles in front of him, invited him to come to the palace to show Jesus that he's the boss and that he needs to come and perform for him. Mostly out of a desire to mock Jesus and then have him killed like he did with John the Baptist. Let's look at the context here. Jesus had just miraculously fed 4,000 people. Not because he had to prove anything, but because he had compassion for them and it was in his power to do so. In spite of this amazing miracle, 
The Pharisees wanted more signs and wonders, taunting Jesus to prove his worth. The disciples left the scene and they're now in a boat. <laughs> when they realized that Jesus was speaking about leaven, the leaven, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. They automatically thought Jesus was talking about yeast and bread because <laughs> leaven is a rising agent. So they started to examine among themselves, what do they have left? Is, are there any bread left from the 4,000? They realized that in their doggy bag, all they had was one loaf. And the followers forgot to bring more than one bread into the boat. And as they heard Jesus giving this caution about the leaven, they began to feel guilty because they forgot to bring more bread. Can you imagine? Jesus then turned to them and he questioned them about the amount of baskets that were collected after feeding the 5,000. They answered, 12. And he asked them, how many baskets did you pick up after the feeding of the 4,000? Seven. And then in verse 17, he said, knowing what they were talking about, he said to them, why are you talking about not having bread? Do you still not see and understand? He says, you've got eyes to see, but you don't see. You have ears to hear, but you don't hear. Are you able to really listen? Remember when I divided the loaves and, and I fed the 5,000 and, and the 4,000 and, and all these baskets were left over and yet you're quabbling about you don't have enough bread? <laughs> Jesus had to shift their thinking away from the human desires for bread and to understand that the problems they faced in a Herodian empire and the religious fanatics were of greater consequence than if they had bread. You see, when they gave Jesus this trick question, it was some of the religious leaders and some Herodians that came to test Jesus so they could go back to Herod, so they could go back to their synagogues, so that they could find a reason to disqualify and kill Jesus right there and then. Jesus knew he was gonna die, but it wasn't his time. Jesus wanted them to understand that those who are looking for miracles, who are trying to prove who he, who he was, like Herod and the Pharisees, had evil motives. So watch out for them. They are evil and they're deadly. Not everyone who's inquiring about Jesus have good motives and we gotta be careful about who's calling, about who's inquiring because their motives are not always good. He said, open your eyes, disciples. Don't get caught up in spiritual deception. You know, we're living in a time when we too need to heed Jesus' warning. We have a lot of Herods and modern day prophets who are claiming that Jesus was confirmed in this way or that or telling us stuff. But we need to be careful of the leaven. The prophetic words from many so-called prophets today are dangerously frightening and deceptive. We can get to the place where we believe that following Jesus means all our earthly desires and wishes will be fulfilled. But Jesus didn't come to fulfill all of our earthly desires and wants. He came to shed his blood on Calvary to guarantee us a good life, both down here and in eternity. You know, Peter had the same problem. In our text, we see Peter pulling Jesus aside. You see, he had get, gotten into the habit of pulling people aside, questioning this and questioning that. That's how the devil can use us. And Jesus is telling them in the plain, sad truth, he was going to die. Jesus was not hiding anything. Why is Peter pulling him aside? 
Jesus is speaking openly to his followers. People don't like to hear the truth, especially when it's the truth about death. And so he's issuing a, 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 a rebuke on Jesus. <laughs> don't say that, Jesus. And Jesus turned and looked at his followers. In that moment, he's thinking, Peter might be, be tempted to be deceived, but I've got to make it plain to all those who follow me that my mission on this earth is to die for them. He told Peter not to talk that way. He said, go away from me, Satan. You don't care about the things of God, but only about the things people think are important. And, and you see, this is the key. This is the key. Let them focus on the world, Peter, but not you. Their money can't buy their souls. Don't be ashamed of me and my teaching. Just follow me. If anyone is ashamed of me and my teaching, I will be ashamed of them when I return in all my Father's glory and with the holy angels. Watch out, Peter. Jesus is saying to the crowds following him, in this evil and doubtful generation, be focused on me. In the end, I will return and I want to declare you worthy of honor and not shame. You know, the apostle Paul in his message to the Roman church made this declaration. He said in, in Romans 1 and 16, I am not ashamed of the good news because it's the power of God that he uses to save everyone who believes, to save the Jews first and then to save the non-Jews. The problem with the fulfillment of desires without the struggle can lead to complacency, apathy, and disengagement. Jesus knew that those who would follow and come after him would need a kind of steadfast faith. Even if they don't see miracles, even if they don't see signs and wonders, they would believe because Jesus' mission was more important than what other people told them. It was more than manifesting his presence through miracles, but to understand that he's the Messiah sent from God to die for their sins. The mission involved the shameful cross and he wanted his followers to prepare that eventuality, be prepared for that eventuality and not become defeated with the feelings of abandonment and shame that would soon follow. May we not become a generation, church, of believers who are only concerned about what is in it for me. May Jesus not have to remind us of how many baskets we have picked up after the miracles of bread. Because we just have one bread now. Don't be discouraged. The same God who allowed you to pick up the extras after the miracle is the same God who sees that you only have one bread now. You know, it's like some of us who go to a fancy dinner <laughs> and there's a lot of food, but we get home and we're starving. Or the next day, we can't figure out what to pack for lunch. And then we say, oh my goodness, I should have taken a container with me. Some of us, on the other hand, always remember to bring our containers so we can pack up the leftovers to take home. This is what the disciples were thinking. That's earthly thinking. What happened to all the leftovers? We just have one loaf left. Can you imagine Andrew asking Peter, did you bring any? And I imagine that one loaf was in Andrew's tote bag. But you see, Jesus is reminding them, I'm, I'm here for, for things bigger than bread. <laughs> Jesus had to remind them that he was their provider. 
that as we have desires that are unmet, we can embrace the struggle knowing that what we have in Jesus is more lasting than the desires of this life. Jesus also wanted them to know that even though he will die a shameful Roman death, that it was not the end. That if they would continue to trust and follow, he will be there for them in the end. And on his glorious return, they will truly live. Jesus wanted to prepare a band of followers who were determined to follow even when the miracles were not evident. Even when the power was not displayed. That Jesus was more than fish and bread. Jesus realized that if his followers were like all humankind, concerned only about the material benefits of the miracles, then when he left, they would not remember him because he was no longer here in their presence to do the great works. You know, as people, we desire things and we may be even envious of people who have stuff. <laughs> Jesus reminds them that stuff is only temporary. Stuff will only last so long. You know, as, as Dr. Hinohara says in his in his writings after 60 you finish working for the family <laughs> you finish acquiring things for the family then what then what is your purpose then we find something meaningful to give all ourselves to you see stuff will only last for so long stuff will one day diminish and pass Jesus wants us to hold our desires and ambitions lightly. Understanding that everything we possess on this earth is nothing compared to the everlasting glory that is prepared for us. Jesus spoke to his followers and to us today. Don't just follow for the miracles alone. Follow because he's the Messiah the son of God who came into the world to save us from sin. That's the greatest miracle. The writer of John captures a similar twist on this conversation after the feeding of the 5,000. It seems that these miracles were not enough to convince many of Jesus's followers that he was the promised Messiah. There's something about humankind. It doesn't matter how much you do. If people don't want to believe in you, they're going to find ways to criticize you. It doesn't matter how much miracles Jesus did. There were many who did not believe. In John's account, the people were following and they did not see Jesus get into the boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. When he appeared on the other side, they were like, well, Jesus, how did you get here? But then they proceeded to ask Jesus to do some more miracles. You know, like if it's a show. As if Jesus should just fulfill their desires with one miracle after another. And of course, Jesus wanted them to know that doing miracles was not what he came for. Becoming an earthly king was not what he came for. But they were blind and they missed the point. This is how John wrote it. He says in, in chapter 6, 26 to 29, the book of John, he said, Jesus answered them when they were asking him to do some more miracles. I tell you the truth. You aren't looking for me because you saw me do miracles. You're looking for me because you ate the bread and we're satisfied. Don't work for food that spoils. Work for the food that stays good always and gives eternal life. The Son of Man will give you this food because on him, God the Father has put his power. The people asked, what are the things God wants us to do? And Jesus answered, the work of God, the work that God wants you to do is this. Plain and simple. 
believe the one he sent. And sometimes in, in, in our Christian faith, we get obsessed about works. We want to demonstrate to people that we've got power, you know, and that we can pray for them and they get healed and all this stuff. Here's the work. Believe the one, the one he sent. The clear message for the early followers of Jesus and for us today is that we should not live just to fill the desires of the flesh. We should not just live because we want to do what other people say we should do or to be. Our desires of the flesh can be fulfilled. Jesus does care about physical needs. Yes, he's shown that throughout his ministry. And food is important, yes. He even cursed a fig tree for not providing food to feed his disciples. And once when they were out fishing on the Sea of Galilee, when they got out of the boat, Jesus was on the shore. They weren't quite too sure, sure who it was because Jesus had already died and resurrected. And lo and behold, as they approached him, they realized it was Jesus. And he wasn't just appearing. He was looking out for them. He actually had fish and bread waiting for them on the fire. So Jesus cares about our material needs. He cares about things like clothing and shelter. He advised his followers not to worry about those things because the heavenly father will provide those things. He advised his first disciples to follow him. And he said to them, I don't have a fixed address, but he understood the hospitality of his people. He even encouraged them to open their doors to each other, to share their tunics with each other. So yes, Jesus does care about our physical needs. But most importantly, the primary reason that he came, that he was sent, is so that we can believe in him. You know, not that we should stop praying and believing, for miracles. But Jesus wants us to know that that's not the primary reason. One, we need to know that we have to follow him and must be willing to give up everything, even our very life. Secondly, if you're about saving your life, he says, you will lose it. You will forfeit the true life. It's not about saving yourself. You will forfeit the true life. But if you give up your life, yourself, for the true life, guess what? You will get it. You will get it. And so Jesus encouraged them in his message to focus on the good news of his coming. You know, a lot of, a lot of people don't attend prayer meetings or prayer services anymore because they're disappointed in God. Yeah, sometimes we don't know we're disappointing God, but we see the exercise as futile. They feel that praying is a waste of time because they have conflict with their desire and their struggle. They think it's who they pray with that matters. But here's the thing. It's not who you pray with that matters. It's to whom you pray that matters. And Jesus says, come together, show up, encourage one another. Jesus is expected to perform miracles for us every time we pray. And I, I would like to believe that Jesus does answer every prayer that we offer to him. Sometimes the answer is not what we want or expect. I can't claim that I have more faith because I prayed for my child to be healed and he was healed. Than the mother who lost her son to the same illness. As Dr. Hinara says, no one illness is the same. None of us have a monopoly on faith. We don't get to determine the outcome of our prayers. We take them to the Lord in faith and leave them there. And we trust God even when the answer does not seem fear. Even when we're still in the midst of our struggles and our desires are not met, our faith remains steadfast. Amen? 
It's no surprise that many in our religious circles today find themselves hooked on teachers and evangelists and prophets and prophetesses who teach and promise them miracles. We all become so worked up in emotions with the verbiage that make people think we possess much more faith than the saints of old. There's a caution. A caution. You see, the church can promise you a lot of things. But Jesus is only concerned that you see him in the midst of of your life battles and struggles. You see, Jesus is teaching about what it means to believe, not in the things he does, but in the man himself. And our message today may seem negative to some, but you see the teaching of Jesus and his love alone does not bring attendance and money to some churches because our desires trump the idea of the cross. Our message seems negative when we speak of carrying our cross, when we speak of embracing suffering and hardship. We don't want to talk about struggles and crosses. We want to talk about healings and miracles. But here's the reality. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to come after me, you must take up your cross. That's spiritual talk. That's faith. We will ultimately have to face our crosses, church, and have struggles just as Jesus predicted and his first church experienced. They did not end well. They did not have a great time as far as earthly expectation goes. And this is where the church needs to put first things first. John says that the signs and wonders were done so that the people of his day might believe that Jesus was who he says he was. And we believe today that Jesus is who he says he was based on the word of their testimonies the holy word of God. They were among Jesus' followers, those who were impatient with him because in their estimation, he could have leveraged this power. He could have overthrown the Roman authorities. He could have given them their freedom from political oppression. This is the type of religious fanaticism that has led to many futile wars for in antiquity and even today. This is the red line of belief in, G in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, and the politicizing of our faith. We got to be careful about politicizing the faith that we've been given, that Jesus' blood was shed for. Jesus is no more concerned about your political affiliation. He's most concerned about your faith in him as the refuge for your soul. Caesar and all the Caesars had their own evil, wicked ways, yet Jesus did not join in vilifying him. When the opportunity presented itself, as Matthew explained in, in Matthew 22, some of the Pharisees left that place and made plans to trap Jesus in saying something wrong. They sent some of their own followers and some of the group from the Herodians to say to him, teacher, we know that you're an honest man <laughs> and that you teach truth about God's way. You know, people always butter you up before they pull you down. <laughs> and so he said, teacher, I know you're good. I, I, I know you're honest. I know, I know you teach truth. <laughs> you're not afraid of what other people think about you because you pay no attention to who they are. This is all buttering up Jesus. So, so he says, tell us what you think. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Mm. You know, Jesus knows our heart. He knows that they asked this question and they buttered him up because they want to they wanna trick him. Here's what Jesus says. And sometimes we need to have the frankness of Jesus. He says, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me a coin used for paying taxes. And so they showed him a coin. 
And then Jesus asks, whose image and name is on the coin? They say, Caesar's. <laughs> Jesus said to them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Give to God the things that are God's. When the men heard what Jesus said, they were amazed and they left him and they went away. Duh. Hmm. You know, here's the thing. We face the same kinds of issues in our society today where people are trying to trap the faith of God and, and the word of God and put the, the, the Christian faith in all kinds of packages. But we got to be careful that we don't become hypocrites. You know, the disposition of our heart and mind is very complex. And this is part of our struggle. We can find ourselves locked up in cycles of thinking and processing the world. You know, our mind affects what we do and how we behave and how we respond to life situations. You see, we are by nature products of our thought life. We got to be careful who and what we listen to because the mind is shaped by the physical world around us, by social, political influences around us. And, you know, as I'm writing this message, I'm seeing the horrific images that are coming out of Afghanistan. You know, a lot of what is going on in Afghanistan has to do with religious ideation. The people responsible for the attacks have minds just as we do. How can we possibly understand the mind and the heart of humankind? We're so easily influenced by others. Influenced by religious ideologies, messed up thinking, vain imaginations of men. And you know, this should serve as a wake up call for all of us. Remember January 6th in the United States? There were Christians there as well. When the church is becoming embroiled in politics to the point of divisions in the church, exodus over political positions, we know this is counter to Jesus' teaching and the plan for his church. What is going on? You know, there will always be men and women who will come along and exploit our desires and our dreams and our expectations that tell you that this is not God's will for you to have some struggles in your life. That, that political um, engagement can fix our culture and our society. They may make you become victims and sometimes emotional basket cases. When God only asks us to be firm and steadfast in our faith in him, Jesus would not ask his disciples to strengthen the faith of others if he did not expect them to suffer difficulties. He expects that we will have hardship. Anyone can believe that life is good and everything they desire in life would be fulfilled. Can a man or woman still desire God when the chips are down? to push through the darkness of the soul and touch the light? How about that? How about the mind and disposition of the ancient Job who declared in Job 13 and 15, God may kill me, but I still will trust him and offer my defense. You know, there's a motive of even those all through the word of God, even though, even though, you know, I may need to speak a message on that sometime, even though, you know, there are even those in your life, but keep moving, keep trusting God. You know, the Bible talks about people who are steadfast in their faith. They will learn that they were punished because they hated my laws and refused to obey my rules. But even though this is true, I will not turn away from them when they are in the land of their enemies. That's God saying, even though his people disobey him, even though they stray away from him, he will not forsake them. Job 33 reminds us that God is in the even those of life 
God speak sometimes one way and sometimes another, even though people do not understand it, Job says. Ezra says to the people, even though they were afraid of the people living around them, they built an altar where it had been before and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord morning and evening. You know, Daniel was told that he shouldn't pray three times a day. And even though he was told that, that, that he would die as a consequence, his faith was steadfast. And there's Queen Esther. Go tell the Jewish people, she said, in Susa. For my sake, fast, do not eat or drink for three days, night and day. I and my servant girls will also fast. Then I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I die, I die. Amen. You know, David, the psalmist, allowed his desire and struggle with aging to be a fact, but with steadfast faith to make a difference in his old age. Listen, it's a fact that we're going to get old, but make a difference even though. <laughs> he said, even though I am old and gray, do not leave me, O God. I will tell the children about your power. I will tell those who live after me about your might. David is saying, even though I'm old and gray, I'm going to preach, I'm going to proclaim. You know, it's time for us, church, to be sure of our faith and who it is that we're following. In this individualistic Western mindset that we have, most of us by nature are rebellious and resistant to authority. In the West, we're the most autonomous and self-opinionated people on the planet. We're not good at following God, oh man. We love our own way. As I confess that we are like sheep constantly going astray because we love our own way. You know, in this past few years, we've witnessed so much rebellion and exercise of rights on every level of society, protests in the workplace, protests for, against the government, protests in the church. Some major big changes and shifts have occurred in some churches where there have been exodus of people just leaving the church. And most of it, some of the people don't even know why they're leaving and what's going on defiance, political persuasions. And oh, that we be careful of the leavens of the Pharisees and the Herods of our age. As followers of Christ, it would be appropriate to step back and ask ourselves, who are we following? Is this a movement we are following or is it part of our faith journey? How can we be sure that we're following Jesus Christ, especially when it seems counterintuitive and does not jive with scripture. The word follow is another motif found throughout the Bible. The command to follow is repeated through the Old and New Testaments. From the be very beginning, God gave instructions to our first parents that were meant to be followed. The Lord put the man in the Garden of Eden to take care of it and to work it. And the Lord commanded him, you may eat the fruit from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat the fruit from the tree which gives the knowledge of good and evil. If you ever eat that fruit from that tree, you will die. And you know the rest of the story. They failed to follow that command because they did not trust the one who created them and gave them all that they had. You know, we have, but our eyes always see, our ears always hear what is not for us. You see, our problems started a long time ago. This same God throughout history and human of humankind have constantly been asking us to follow him, to walk by faith in him, to walk in humility and in obedience to him. And that is called trust. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus 
but to trust and obey. And as we look at this idea of following, we see some great personalities in the word of God, people who followed the plan, the message, and the purpose. And they did it with steadfast faith to the degree that they triumphed in the end. Oh yes, we still live in the ark, but until we get to glory, we will not see the full circle. Today, as we close this series on following Jesus, let's look at lives of those who stepped out in faith and followed the footsteps of Jesus. As believers today, we need to differentiate ourselves from the desire to follow religious fads, feel good spirituality, political persuasions, temporary earthly desires. Jesus made it clear to his disciples that his kingdom was not of this earth. Jesus came to bring a gift that would outlast time and eternity. Even if you live to be a hundred, God would never be finished with you yet. His love knows no limit. His grace knows no measure. A love that nothing and no one can satisfy. So beware, open your eyes and ears to see and listen to the word of God. Our focus and our mindset must be drawn to Jesus as a central theme of the Gospels. Daryl Brock in his Brock in his NIV commentary on Luke gives us a contribution to this understanding. He says, Luke is trying to help us to see Jesus' mission this way. He says, what does Jesus do? Luke explains how he revealed that the way to God is through a sinner's recognition that one must turn to God for help. The author also makes clear that the way to God is through Jesus. To show his power, Jesus preached the kingdom of God and the time of fulfillment. He overcame nature, exercised demons, healed diseases, and raised one from death to show he could overcome every type of enemy that opposes humanity. All the while, he prepared his disciples for the journey of salvation by showing them that glory was reached only after suffering. What does Jesus want people to do? He calls sinners to repent, disciples to take up their crosses daily as they follow him, and witnesses to take the message of repentance for forgiveness of sins to all the nations. He promised the spirit for the task. Since many will reject their message, still they are called to love their enemies and pray for them. As follows of Jesus, unquote, we must be prepared to grow through suffering and struggles. We cannot be changed or renewed without knowing the mind of Christ, and we cannot follow Jesus without steadfast faith. It's logical. It's a domino effect. It, it is conscious engagement with God's word that changes our very nature. And it's also maintained by our engagement with that word. It means making the time to apply oneself to the daily engagement and practice and the teaching of the Bible. It means showing up for prayer and Bible engagement, even when your specific prayers are not answered in the way you wish for God to answer your prayers. That's called steadfast faith. Our job is to know the plan of and how we fit into God's purposes. We must also believe that the concerns we have for our life involve God's purposes for us as well. We must remember how many baskets were left over from the last time. God has brought you through stuff. He can do it again. God is not only concerned for his mission, but for you as well. God understands your hurts. 
He understands your fears, your anxieties, your doubts. Jesus came to this earth to participate in the human aspects of our lives so that we can relate to him with that understanding that he knows. This God became flesh and dwelt among men. Jesus has been identified as a high priest who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Remember how many baskets were left over. In Hebrews, Paul wrote, for this reason, Jesus had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way so he could be their merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Then Jesus could die in their place and take away their sins. That's why he came. And so we need to develop a steadfastness if we're going to follow Jesus. We must walk in steadfast faith. And to develop the steadfast faith to move forward, we must resist what people are saying. Like Jesus rebuked Peter, you only care about what others are saying. Follow me, follow me. Resist the darkness of this present age and the culture of opposition to the mission of God. The call to follow Jesus goes beyond what we believe and sing about. The spirit of the Antichrist is prevalent in all sectors of our world. And like those who have paved the way before us, we can anticipate that we will be challenged. We will be challenged once we make it clear that we are Christians and that we believe in Jesus. We will also be distracted by those who fall away and become casualties to the struggles and difficulties of life. Some will fall away and they will convince you that you're on the wrong path. Sometimes you might feel disconnected to God and the people of faith. At times you, you may feel like you're the only one experiencing anxieties and fears and loneliness and abandonment. But Jesus is in the struggle with you. Following Jesus comes at a cost, but not without benefits. As we remain disciplined, as we remain steadfast, focus on his word, we can stand in the midst of it. Many of us have gone to school or have learned a trade or a discipline. We know that it is a struggle. But as you hear your name being called by the person handing out your graduation certificate, all you can feel is a relief, pride, joy, satisfaction in your accomplishment. All you feel is gratitude for the reward of years of sacrifice. Some graduation ceremonies, parents wipe away tears. Some celebrate with parties and have bragging rights that they should enjoy. Just imagine what will happen when we get to the end of life's struggles. When, when the ark is completed. When you hear the voice like many waters saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. One songwriter says, oh, that will be glory for me. Glory for me. Glory for me. When by his grace, I shall look on his face. That will be glory. Be glory for me. But in the meantime, we walk by faith, not by sight. Life lived in integrity has its rewards. You know, in a missional uh, book written by Dr. Barry L. Callan, The Call to Holiness, he talks about having that incarnational integrity, that living out the purposes of God that principle that shapes our theological thinking in the church of God is called incarnational integrity. The concern has been to realize that in the present call of Jesus Christ, for disciples to be authentic representatives of the coming reign of God that already has arrived in Jesus. This concern 
is in the focus on sanctification and a millennial stance of the movement of the Church of God. Holiness for the individual means a genuine set-apartness so that one's very life becomes a living sacrifice. Spirit-directed spirit presence of the kingdom of God, an alternative to the patterns and powers of the world. He said in both cases, it means a congruence of divine intent and actual occurrence in the world by the power of the Spirit. This is the radical and responsible dimension of having received divine grace. There is integrity in Christian belief only when it is accepted by faith and its implications are actually lived out in one's life." Unquote. We receive Christ by faith, but we live in integrity when we live out that faith. This proclamation and this practice requires steadfastness. Even if we live past 100, it is a faith that sees beyond our lifespan and in the lives and in the investments we make in the lives of others. I know this is a deep message today, but I want to remind us that everything on earth is just an arc. In heaven, it's a perfect circle. The only thing that would last is our steadfast faith in Jesus and his work through us to proclaim the good news. We will have struggles in the drama of life. But Jesus calls us to ignore the barriers that we face down here. The mental, physical, emotional, spiritual barriers that fatigue us and push ahead in steadfast faith. Hmm. You know, in our culture, we tend to think that people who have money Good jobs, education, house, and a spouse with children are fulfilled and happy. When we hear of divorce and illness and loss, we, 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 we make statements like, oh, they have wealth, they have, they're famous, they, they have, well, how could this happen to them? But this is the problem. We're brought into the narrative that all things on earth are what makes us happy. But it's worthy to note that what is important in life and not necessarily what we can put our hands on, on this planet. Jesus wants us most of all to believe in him. When we become discouraged and feel useless because people say and think what they want about us, don't let others put you in a box and make you feel you're washed up and that God is finished with you. As long as God lends you breath, church, be on mission and follow him. Think about people putting you into preconceived boxes. I'm reminded of an illustration I read in Donald Capps' Decades of Life, A Guide to Human Development. He writes this, he says, this old guy goes to their doctor for a checkup. <laughs> the doctor says, you're in good shape for a 60 year old. The guy says, who says I'm 60 years old? The doctor says, you're not 60? How old are you? The guy says, I turn 80 next month. <laughs> the doctor says, gosh, 80? Do you mind if I ask you at what age your father died? The guy says, who says my father's dead? <laughs> the doctor says, he's not dead? No, he'll be 104 this year. The doctor says, with such a good family history, your grandfather must have been pretty old when he died. The guy says, who says my grandfather is dead? The doctor says, he's not dead. The guy says, nope, he'll be 129 this year and he's getting married next week. The doctor says, amazing. 
But why at his age would he want to get married? The guy says, who says he wants to? <laughs> you know, people can put us in boxes, tell us what we should be doing and when. Jesus is saying to you today, that's not all you are. You're not defined by what others do or who people think you should be. Your steadfast faith in Jesus is more than your ability, your ability to do great exploits down here. What we do for God, that will be perfected in heaven. It's just the ark. Stay hooked on Jesus. Even if you can't see your way out of this emotional fog you are in, stay focused on your faith. Even if that cancer is not getting better, stay steadfast on your faith. Even if that relationship is over, stay steadfast in your faith. Even if you have to surrender mother, father, sister, brother, child, friend to follow Jesus, stay steadfast in your faith and immovable as the apostle Paul administered the church in Corinth. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, stand strong. Do not let anything move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that the work in the Lord is never wasted. Jesus' disciples were no different than we are today. And as Jesus called them to follow him, they may have questioned his teaching and direction. They did not always get what Jesus is saying and what his mission was, but they remained steadfast in their faith. And that faith has shaped the church down through the annals of time. It is to these doubtful, struggling disciples we owe our faith today. It is their stories that are captured in the annals of the pages of the Bible that gives us direction and hope as we follow Jesus in this century. As followers of Jesus, we may not always see and hear what Jesus taught them while he was among them, but in the end, they followed in faith. They took up their crosses. They fulfilled Jesus' desires for them. Heaven will be worth it all. In closing, I want to share a song by Charles W. Naylor, at least the lyrics of it. A man who was familiar with struggles that did not get healed, but his faith was steadfast. He wrote a hymn that we love in the Church of God that demonstrates to us that we can remain faithful, faithful to God, even from a bed of affliction as Nela was. He says, Spirit holy, in me dwelling, ever work as thou shalt choose. All my ransom powers and talents for thy purpose thou shalt use. Spirit holy, spirit holy, all my being now possess. Lead me, rule me, work within me through my life. Thy will express. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter the disease, doesn't matter your brokenness. He says, oh, how sweet is thy abiding. Oh, how tender is the love thou dost shed abroad within me from the Father's heart above. No bitterness. Just love. He says, Thou hast cleansed me for thy temple, garnished with thy graces rare. All my soul thou art enriching by thy fullness dwelling there. Verse 4 says, In me now reveal thy glory. Let thy might be ever shown. Keep me from the world's defilement, sacred for thyself alone, spirit holy, spirit holy in me dwelling, ever work as thou shalt choose. Oh, what a song to write in the conflict of desire versus struggle. 
Oh, what a place of peace and contentment that can be found in steadfast faith even when our bodies are broken. I pray today that you will begin to live, really live in the face of your struggles and that the peace and the joy that money cannot buy will be your portion today. As you get up each day, may you move in steadfast faith in Jesus. No matter what happens, knowing that he will care for you. Remember how many baskets of leftovers you collected. And be aware of the leaven of the hypocrites. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. I hope you will join us again next week. Actually, next month we will be celebrating 41 years of ministry at the Planting Community Church. And we have a great program planned for the whole month. Exciting presentations. And we hope you will celebrate with us and join us. God bless you. Amen.